Well, good evening. Welcome to worship here at Incarnation Lutheran Church. My name is Kai Nielsen, one of the pastors here, and on behalf of this community, we're delighted you could be here as we're in the center of Holy Week and beginning these three critical stories that we're going to be telling over the next three series of services that we're going to have. Uh, if you're joining us online, we're delighted that you could be with us. Uh, again, uh, this is a good enough time to grab your stuff that you can uh, use for your own home communion tonight so you can celebrate with us when we get to that point uh, in this service. Uh, we do tonight have a couple of students, I hope, I think, who are going to be here who are celebrating their first communions. We do. That's fantastic. Congratulations and thanks for being here. And you know what we did tonight just for you? We're going to have communion up in front. Just for you tonight. <laughs> uh, a couple of things about the, the service itself. Um, at the end of the service, there's going to be a chance for us to, it's called the stripping of the altar, and at that point what happens is that we take away all of the stuff that's on the main altars and the back altars and the front altar, and it's a symbolic way of just getting the sense as we move to Good Friday, so it's kind of the pivot to Good Friday service, about the utter abandonment that Jesus experienced as he made his way toward the cross. The abandonment of friends, the abandonment of dignity in so many ways, and ultimately the abandonment of his own life and being. And so that's kind of the picture of it. Uh, so the service will end in complete silence, and uh, then we'll lift the lights a little bit at the end, and you can make your way out. But please come back then tomorrow, because we're going to tell use the seven last words of Jesus from the cross as the, the architecture for the service, and there's just going to be some very moving music that's going to be used around it. I'm going to keep it getting darker and darker and darker in this space as we make our way to it. It's incredibly important for us to know the heartache of Good Friday so that we can know the hopefulness of Easter Sunday morning. So if you're able to make it to all three of those uh, sets of services, that would be great. Tomorrow morning uh, at 11 o'clock, there's a special service for parents who have young kids, a uh, very appropriate way for you to tell the story uh, together. And 7 o'clock, we'll be back in this space. Three services Sunday morning, all the same services, 8, 9, 15, and 10, 30. If you know anybody in your community who doesn't have a place to be a part of a worshiping community uh, this season, please invite them to come and join you over these next few days. That's it for our announcements. I'm going to invite you to stand as we begin with these opening words of confession. God is love, and those who center their lives in love center their lives in God, and God's love dwells deeply in them. May God's love be the center of our lives. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God's love would ma was made visible for us and for all humanity. May Jesus' sacrificial love become the way we choose to live. The spirit of love leads us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. May that spirit be at the heart of all we say and do. Forgive us, O oh God, for all of the ways that we become distracted from centering our lives in you denying your love for us, demanding our ways at the expense of others, distancing our lives from those who need us the most. We pause now for a moment of silent confession and reflection. Friends in Christ, Jesus reveals the heart of God, a heart of love that forgives all of our sins and renews our lives for active service. May God's love be the center of our lives. We sing together.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, your love was embodied in Jesus Christ, who broke bread with and poured the wine with the one who would betray him, the one who would deny him, and all those who would abandon him. Help us to remember your Son and the fullness of his love expressed on the cross for us. Unite us to him through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may be nourished to embody your love in this world. Amen. I invite you to be seated.
Let's pray together. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this night, for a chance to gather together as your beloved community, to remember on this night, this night in which you were betrayed, when you gathered round with your disciples, the one who would betray you, the one who would deny you, and all the rest who would abandon you. And yet you gave of yourself so freely. And so that is what we seek to do tonight, to receive what you have for us. And so we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts gathered here would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So tonight, Monday, Thursday, as many of you probably know and remember, is about the commands that Jesus gives us on that last night when Jesus was betrayed. Sometimes on Monday, Thursday, we focus on the story of when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples and he washed their feet and remember the command that Jesus tells them to go and to love as he has loved them. Uh, But tonight we're going to actually focus on a different command that Jesus gives, Uh, a command where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. It's a story of when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And you can find it in four different places in the New Testament. Uh, in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and and what do you think the fourth one is? No, it's 1 Corinthians. See, the joy of knowing the questions that you're going to ask is you can make yourself look smarter than you really are. Um, That's the pure joy in this. But yeah, it's in 1 Corinthians. It's actually in John that we get the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we don't have that story. Uh, John focuses on this different command of loving others as as, uh, Jesus has loved them. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and 1 Corinthians, we have the story of the Last Supper, of when Jesus institutes these commands. And uh, we're going to look at the story from Luke's perspective, mainly because Luke Luke does something different than what Matthew and Mark do and what Paul does in 1 Corinthians. Luke adds a few elements to it, switches things around uh, in some ways, and we're going to talk about some of them. Uh, Some of them I'm not going to talk about, like the fact that Luke mentions two cups being shared, so that one you'll have to figure out on your own. Um, But there are some other unique things that Luke does that Matthew and Mark do and Paul, uh, uh, rather than Paul. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke 22. Uh, We're going to start in verse uh, 14. Hear these words from the book that we love. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after the supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table, for the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Tomorrow is Passover. Uh, Some of you know this. Maybe it's on your calendar. You may get an alert tomorrow on your phone saying it's Passover. Uh, And Passover, as you know, is that day when millions of Jewish people will gather together in their homes or in communities and share that Passover meal, remembering how thousands of years ago God liberated the Hebrew people from being enslaved in Egypt. And Jesus celebrates this Passover meal with his disciples. Uh, There's this sense of eagerness that Jesus has to be with his disciples. It even says it in verse 15 that Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. There's this longing that Jesus has to 
to celebrate it because Passover itself is about two main things. It's about remembrance and it's about hope. On that night, as millions of Jewish people gather together, they'll ask this very first question of why is this night different from all other nights? Why is this night different from all other nights? And, and maybe it's a question we can ask ourselves in the context of, of our Christian faith together. Why is this night different from all other nights? Um, it's not because it's snowing and it's April 14. Uh, my friend Amy Maka said shared with me this tidbit of information that this is the eighth year in a row that it snowed on April 14. She has a wealth of information. If you want to know anything that doesn't have any meaning to it at all, just ask her. She'll be glad to tell you it. Um, I, I'm sorry, Amy, that was mean. But, there, but why is this night different from any other night? It's because this night, Jesus institutes a new covenant. He adds to it not only the, that, that uh, what we celebrate here at communion isn't just about remembering Jesus, and it's not just about that hope for future but it's even more so about having communion with Christ, that we get to share in this communion with Christ. Now, how does that take place? It's really fascinating because one of the things that, that we think about in communion is, is that Christ is present with us in, under, and through the bread that Christ is in, under, and through the cup, that Christ's presence is, is something that's, that's something that we can touch, that we can taste. It's tactile. One of the benefits of communion is, is that it's a way for grace to be experienced. It's not just something that we think about, but it's something that we can touch and feel and taste together. On Ash Wednesday, six weeks ago, we began our Lenten journey, inviting you all to come forward to receive the mark of the cross of ashes on your forehead. And, and as you came forward, we said to you, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so many of you came forward. And, and as one of the persons who got to put ashes on people, there was this, this intimate moment to share with each of you that I had. And there is a difference in putting that on a person that I know is terminally ill, and then right away putting it on a young child and saying those same words, remember you are dust, to dust you shall return. We gave you a chance to respond. Do you remember what that response was? That the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And what was so fascinating about that was that after I would say, remember you're a dust and dust you shall return, so many of you said, but the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And, and when you said that, some of you like leaned in as if it was a secret, <laughs> as if I didn't know. <laughs> Others of you kind of stood proud, had your shoulders back, but the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. It was, it was an act of defiance. It was an act of protest. Ash Wednesday is that night where death feels so definite. It feels so final. And yet there is this tension that we believe, that we hold on to, that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Over and over and over again. I, I was expecting one of you to be like my mom, wagging their finger at me. No, 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 Joel. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. I thought someone was going to do that to me. I really did. There is, there is this sense that, that today, Monday, Thursday, what makes this night different from all the others is that today we get a chance to experience that steadfast love of the Lord enduring forever. That in communion we are offered that enduring love of God that we can partake of. And this happens in the way that, that Jesus invites all of us to it. Because in this night, when Jesus was at that table, the night in which he was betrayed, he does something different. He begins to associate himself with, with the Passover lamb. And many of, of you know this, you've seen this. There's actually an image I want to show you 
uh, of this from the St. John's Bible. This is, uh, if you go into the chapel, you can see this. But in Luke 22, there is this image put up. And you notice Jesus isn't in the image, right? It's only the Passover lamb pouring out its blood for all people. In Luke's gospel, as Jesus says, I have been eagerly desiring to share this Passover meal with you. He then follows it up with these words, before I suffer. In Greek, the words suffer and Passover, they're almost the exact same word. <laughs> There's only one word different, one letter different between the two of them. Jesus embodies the Passover lamb. And Luke wants us to remember that. And why is the Passover lamb so significant? Well, it's, it's not because a Passover lamb would be slain in order to atone for somebody's sin or for someone's guilt. There were other sacrifices for that. But the Passover lamb was meant to point to God liberating God's people out of Egypt. It was meant as a sense of freedom. And so imagine yourself sitting at table with Jesus as, as the Roman Empire continues to press their thumb on you and Jesus tells you this very thing that he is to be this Passover lamb. There is this new sense of, of freedom, of liberation, of hope that he's pointing to. And what's more is that it's not, it's not just the Romans that Jesus is talking about here, but Jesus is talking about something for all people something that everyone can experience. It's, it's actually this sign of defiance and protest against sin and death itself that Jesus points to. You can take that down. In this story, Jesus reminds his disciples of who he is and what his purpose here on earth is all to be. Now, one of the things that Luke does is, is Luke opens up our eyes to, to maybe even considering who is welcome at this table, more so than what Matthew and Mark do, and especially more so than what Paul does. One of the things that Luke does is he tells the story of how Judas betrays Jesus, but, but he leaves it for the end of the words of institution. In Matthew and in Mark and in 1 Corinthians, it all begins with on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. And, and they talk about Judas betraying Jesus right away at the beginning. And there's this ambiguity that we have as to whether or not Judas actually was offered the bread and the cup. But in Luke's gospel, Luke waits until the very end so that we can be confident to know that even the one who would betray him was still welcome into this the sense of love that Jesus has for him. And it got me thinking, are there other stories in Luke's gospel that, that push this even further? Push this even further to the limits beyond of anything we can understand of, of what God's love means for us, of the forgiveness that God offers to us? And I started to think about some of the stories that we only find in Luke's gospel, like the parable of the prodigal son. You remember this story? Where the son comes running back to the father, and the father embraces him, puts a cloak on him, gives him a, wing, a ring. They kill the padded calf and have this giant feast. Offers him forgiveness. There's the story of Jesus meeting with a reviled tax collector named Zacchaeus, one who was hated in his whole town of Jericho. And Jesus sits with him and eats with him, and says, today salvation has come to this house, for this man too is a son of Abraham. And what's more is Luke, Luke is the only one to talk about the story of, of the thieves on the cross next to Jesus. When, when Matthew and Mark tell the story, they simply say, and there were two criminals hung on the cross with Jesus, and they reviled him. But Luke, Luke takes it further. Luke tells us that, that Jesus engaged in a conversation with them and promised that one of them would be with him in paradise. Jesus even goes so far, only in the gospel of Luke, to forgive those who crucified him. With his dying breath, he says to God, pleads with God, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Over and over and over and over and over again in Luke's gospel, we see this, this boundless love, this boundless expression of Jesus' forgiveness offered to everyone. 
And so when we think about this, this table, when we think about who is welcome to this table, and we say everyone is welcome to this table, we mean everyone. Those who betray Jesus, those who deny Jesus, those who abandon him in his time of need, those who sin, those who love Jesus with all their heart, are welcome to this table. All of us can come and receive that gift of forgiveness because all of us are in need of it. This table is set for you. This table is set not only because it, it gives us that sense of forgiveness, but what's more is it begins to be this act of defiance against sin and against death. Over the last several years, I've had this unique opportunity, and maybe it's not as unique as I think it is because Kai's told me he can do the same thing. But I get a chance to be with people as they're getting ready to say goodbye to their loved one for the last time. As we're standing together on that threshold between death and life, and we gather together and we pray and we read scripture and we comfort each other, and we take communion together. It's like this final act of defiance against death that communion offers us. One of the practices at the church uh, I used to serve was uh, something that we'd do on these retreats four times a year. Uh, we would talk about these things called dying moments. A dying moment is a time in your life when you are suffering or you're experiencing grief. It may be a broken relationship with a sibling or with a parent. It, it might be this, this grief that you continue to hold on to that you can't seem to let go of. It, it might be this sin that you're struggling with. And we would name these dying moments to one another, seeking forgiveness. And then we would enter into the sanctuary and we would come up to the table and we would grab a piece of bread. And the bread was from communion. And we would hold it up. And we would name that dying moment to Christ. And then we would dip it in the cup and then partake. It was an act of protest, an act of defiance against the hold that death has on all of us. I think this night is different from all other nights because tonight we remember what Christ did for us in dying on the cross. That we can have communion with that same Christ who overextends himself offering forgiveness to everyone and joins us in that shared hope of this future where, where one day we will be with Christ together. And so tonight, if, if you are suffering from something, if there is this dying moment that you are struggling with, I invite you to do a similar thing with your bread. That after you dip it into the cup, to hold it up to the cross, to name that dying moment to Christ, whether out loud or in your heart, and be confident that Christ has taken it on. And then partake and receive that gift of forgiveness and grace. This, this is the proof of the, that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray together. Thank you, O Lord, for your steadfast love, which endures forever. Thank you, O Lord, for a love that welcomes us even when we have a hard time accepting ourselves. Thank you, O Lord, for a love that will never be separate us. Not life, nor death, nor anything else will separate us from your love. And so we pray tonight that anything that we're holding, those dying moments, that we might be able to release them to you, to know that whatever it is that you know that already, you love us dearly, and you want for us to be, to be healed, to be forgiven, to be renewed, to experience something new in our lives, our relationships, and the way we see ourselves responding in the world. We pray, O oh God, for this community as we gather around this, that there might be a sense of, of renewal that we experience uh, even this evening as we head into these last few days of Holy Week. We pray for the Christian church around the world tonight as they gather with one another. May there be the spirit of just crazy radical love that was given to the disciples that day that can be a part of our experience, this community, and that we can extend out to the world, a world that so desperately needs it. Cure us, O oh God, cure us from warring impulse. Cure us, O oh God, from the, the way that we choose to be divided from one another. Cure us, O oh God, from the ways that we put ourselves over other people. Cure us, O oh God, from all the ways that we don't honor the human dignity of the person sitting next to us. We pray, O oh God, that you would give us this gift and that we might extend that gift of your love to the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We remember that it was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Just as a reminder, as for, with that first communion, it's true for all of us that Christ is the host of this meal, so you're all welcome to come forward and receive this gift of his presence. As you'll be ushered up to two stations in the middle, and then we'll fill, finish these sections, and then we'll come over and we'll serve the third station. Um, you'll receive the bread in your hand, and we invite you then to take the bread and dip it into the wine, or there is also grape juice, which is the lighter colored liquid in the small uh, part of the cup in front of you. Uh, if you choose, uh, at this point, if you feel more comfortable taking one of the communion sets that we have, please also feel free to come down the aisle. The communion sets are in the front. You can grab one, and you can still hear the words from the, uh, uh, the presiders today, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. If there are kids here, they'll come forward and also receive a blessing. There are offering plates in each of the center aisles, and if you brought a gift for us for not only the, the way that we can offer ourselves back to God, but for the common work that we have as a community with one another. The communion assistants will come forward, and then we're going to extend the love of Christ to all of you.
strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We're going to continue the story. So after the serving of the meal to the disciples, uh, they pivot and they go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And here are the words. As they were singing the hymn, they went out of the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. Then they went to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray. We sing together. Mm-hmm. 